Thanks to HelloFresh.com for supporting PC Perspective. Receive $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code PCPER30. Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective podcast. This is episode 479, be recorded on December 13th, 2017. I almost said 14 for some reason. I'm Ryan Schrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Alan Malventano. It is the day before Star Wars Eve. Technically, it's the day before Star Wars because they start showing on Thursday. Um, so I celebrated by wearing my uh, favorite, as in just got in the mail yesterday, Star Wars sweater. Oh, um, when are you going to see the movie, right? But yeah, are you going to see the movie tomorrow? <sighs> no, I'm oh, going that's unfortunate. to the North Pole hmm. tomorrow. Thank that's, you very much. That sounds less fun. I'm going to take a train ride with my daughter. On the Polar Express from Lebanon, Ohio to the North Pole, we're going to meet Santa. Sacrifice it. Are you going to wear that sweater? Sh- actually, I probably will. You well, probably, you no, I don't like the way. Well, we'll see. Um, you don't like the cut of his jib. I don't like the cut of his jib. But uh, we're going to go meet Santa. She's going to get a bell, I think. Is that right? I don't uh, know. It doesn't sound dangerous. The movie sounds, I think that's right. She's going to get a bell and a present from Santa, and then we leave, and then I drive an hour home. And having not seen Star Wars. You doubt I've ever seen Polar Express? Um, yes. Okay. And it's interesting. When I watched the movie recently, its character animation is is off now. When oh, it, yeah. I remember when it came out, it was very impressive, mm-hmm. right? It was always a little Uncanny Valley, not quite right. Yeah, like the, the Tom Hanks character is just, a, it's just, yeah. it, it happened like right during, like right after like the first Toy Story, I think, or something. Oh, no, it was way after that. Was it? Yeah. No, it was like 2004. Oh, was it that recently? Well, I mean, yeah. that's still yeah. 13 years ago. Holy crap. Um, but it was 2004. 2004. Good, good, job, good Josh. eye, Josh. Good eye. Um, so anyway, that's what you I'm know, going to I, I do have two children, and they were brought to us around that time, so I've seen Polar Express once or Got twice. It. On, so I will be seeing Star Wars on Friday at 3 p.m., um, taking a sick day, sick lunch, a long lunch on Friday. My wife and kid will be in Columbus, uh, and I'll, I'm going to see it Friday, and I had tickets to Sunday. As well, so. In case you want to see it again, or just you will. See it's it probably again. say it's probably not an M case, so like I'll just see it again. Uh, welcome to the show, I've, I've everybody. Got, I've got an appointment to yeah. my proctologist. It's just like going to the last. Year, Are you going right? to see him again? Just like going to Star Wars. <laughs> you got two appointments, so you can see him again. <laughs> the one of the downsides to this new mic setup, I just realized, is there's no cough button mm-hmm. for me to hit. I guess technically we could still put one down there in line, but it seems like it'd be less effective. Yeah, then we gotta use batteries on them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't want. You just restarted. How could you possibly want to restart again? Anyway, stupid computers. Let's get started with the show, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we record the show on Wednesday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, sort of, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific, pcpar.com slash live. Uh, if you need a little reminder about coming out and hanging out, you can see us in the chat room, hang out, you know. Kyle Bennett of Hard OCP fame is in there cutting jokes, making fun of me in different ways, accusing me of a sexual misconduct. I completely deny all allegations against Kyle. Well, against Alan, against Kyle. That's 100% true. Everything he says. Um, actually, don't actually, I should never have said that out loud. Mm-hmm. What Kyle says is almost assuredly untrue. And a trap. Yeah, that's true. That part's true. Uh, PCPro.com slash subscribe gets you this page here. You g- give me your name, your email address. We'll send you a notification uh, when we are doing our live streams. Some of you may have uh, found that earlier this week we posted a recording on YouTube that looked like a live stream with AMD. We had Scott Wasson here. We were doing a, a, a Radeon Software Adrenaline Edition uh, video. I mean, we recorded it as if it was a live stream. It just it wasn't live. <laughs> We recorded it because they needed to get it done before the holidays, so we mm-hmm. recorded it before the 12th. But in general, we tend to like to do those things live, do prizes and giveaways and all that type of stuff. So uh, that's at pcper.com slash subscribe. If you go to patreon.com slash pcper, you get this page, which is your ability to contribute to us on a monthly recurring basis. If you think the content we create is interesting and useful and valuable and uh, you want to... Do that. Donate to us, if you will. It can be a dollar a month, three dollars a month, five, ten, twenty, a hundred, a thousand dollars a month. We allow all of that to occur. Actually, a thousand dollars a month, I'd be a little bit nervous, and I'd probably wonder if you were stalking us or something like that. You know, you just you just can never be too careful. I'll take it on my personal Patreon, though. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> um, 
They did. For people who were paying attention, the Patreon stuff reverted back. They had these potential changes to um, what the like fee status was going to be. They were going to mm-hmm. like take the fee out of your contribution as opposed to post contribution. They've reverted all that. So if you were somebody, we actually had a couple of people comment to me that like, oh, they saw Patreon was changing their mind, so they reinstituted their uh, uh, Patreon campaign contribution, which we appreciate greatly. If you become a new patron and or increase your patrons during the live stream, I've mentioned your name uh, during the show, as I'm going to do presently for Adam Curtis, who just became a new pledge of $1. Thank you very much for that, Adam. Um, And that's all I got for right now. So thank you guys for that. Uh, Mailbag. This is probably, it's probably going to be the best episode of the mailbag that ever exists. Ever. Will ever uh, could ever exist because Josh Walworth was the man. There's a really confused person in there. Yeah, yeah. I you know and I had a freshly shorn mailbag. This for is the episode. <laughs> this is one you should definitely watch to the end. Uh, Jim did an excellent job <laughs> cutting in some some things in that. So uh, worth taking a look at. This is just you get you get 15 to 20 minutes of Josh sitting in front of a camera talking at you and answering your questions. I don't know what else people want in this life. You know what's amazing? Other than that. It's like 18 minutes long. The longest you've ever gone, right? Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, uh, that's it. Let's get into the stuff. So we're going to mention this real quick. Sebastian posted a review of the Silverstone Primera PM01 RGB tempered glass case review. Look at that photography. This is not stock photos, guys. This is Sebastian. Hard at work. That couch came from Ikea? Sebastian photos. And case reviews for you. Sebastian photos uh, supersede stock photos usually. I I agree with that. I agree with that. There's another one. So this is a a plastic outer shell steel body tempered glass side panel chassis. Full full size ATX. um, $160. A little bit pricey. But most of the ones that are, oops, most of the ones that are tempered glass tend to do that. Um, it has kind of a styling to me. It reminds me of the uh, Silverstone Raven case with the kind of the, the line down the center of it at the top. Um, wait, 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 wait. Okay. <clears throat> oh, holy lord. He has one within, within reach. Within arm's reach. Yes, I do. <laughs> Um, of course, the uh, scrolling stop, stop stop scrolling on yeah. uh, the thing there, so we're gonna have to just screw with that for a little bit. Long story short, uh, it is a case. It is a good case in terms of let's see. It was it's nearly on par with the Corsair Crystal 460X RGB when it comes to temperatures. Uh, it does better than the Corsair Crystal in terms of noise levels. Even though it does come with three front label uh, front RGB fans, do give it some some pretty impressive glow. $159 on Amazon. Check out that review on PCPro.com. Silverstone Primera PM01 RGB. Sebastian would greatly appreciate it. All right. Sorry, Sebastian. In case your view's out of the way, let's get to the actual big news of the week. That guy there. NVIDIA launches the Titan V. This was kind of a surprise. No, not kind of. It was a surprise, right? Um, I had no idea that this was launching. I don't think any other media were, like, told beforehand. I was kind of... Actually, Ken and I were in town. Del Rizzo knew. He probably knew. Maybe they didn't tell him until beforehand either. I don't know. Um, But uh, Ken and I were out of town, and we were at an event, and I was like walking to dinner, and I, oh, my phone buzzed. Let me see what this email is. NVIDIA launches world's most powerful (laughs) graphics card. I'm like, what the fuck, right? (laughs) Like, a little heads up here would be super nice. So the Titan V, it's the first consumer Volta GPU. Volta being the generation after Pascal, the microarchitecture after Pascal for NVIDIA graphics cards. Um, it has existed for some time, right? GV100 is a GPU that's been on the Tesla V100 cards. Um, both, I think there's an add-in card variant of it as well as kind of, a, what do you call that, like socketed version that they built for servers and stuff. I forget what it's called. Oh, um, yeah, I forgot. <coughs> Four um, so it's not like the first time we've ever seen the GPU, but it's the first time we've seen it in like an add-in card with display outputs Mm -hmm. attached, right? 5,120 CUDA cores, uh, 640 tensor cores, which is obviously what makes 
the Volta architecture is so much different than previous stuff. Obviously, a big emphasis on machine learning and GPU compute and all that goodness um, because it has half speed, technically like double precision, as opposed to the consumer cards, which are 132nd yeah. uh, of double precision. Um, so impressive specs, 12 gigs of memory, uh, 3,072-bit memory interface. What's interesting is if you understand, if you knew from like the, the first release of this card, it was a 16-gig card, and it had a 4096, 4096-bit memory interface, HBM2. Mm -hmm. um, they disabled one of the HBM memory stacks on the chip, and that could be a yield issue. Maybe these are GPUs that, that you know, one of the HBM stacks didn't, didn't work out well, couldn't run at the full speed, or it's just a productization issue. Uh, which is like they said, okay, we've we've saturated the market of who we can sell Tesla V100s to, mm -hmm. so we want to make more money still, as it turns out. Let's release the Titan V to consumers, but we can't make it the same performance level, otherwise people are going to be pissed who spent six, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 on those cards. So if we sell this for three grand, you know, we, we degrade the memory performance somewhat. Could it be that if you had to combine a yield thing with some sort of a memory crossbar thing or whatever that like... Okay, we can't use this channel because of the yield. For like, we have to disable some this section of cores here. Um, so that means we yeah. can't use this channel. So just don't put memory. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, just put a blank HBM. It die. could be. Could, yeah. I mean, it could be because I mean that's what they've done with other GPUs. Like you'll have some, you know, previous gen. You have two two hundred fifty six bit GDDR five. Yeah, and then they go to a one ninety two bit. I think there's. It's probably on both sides. It's probably both on the chip and on the, um, you memory know. Side. Uh, uh, yeah, like the implementation of the interposer is the word I was looking for. Might be part of that. I would think that Maybe they natural. just want TDPs to hit 250. So yeah. they had to disable one. Yeah, I mean, Maybe. I'm sure that affects some of it. Do you think one HBM stack would actually add that much? I would have, if I were to guess, one HBM stack might have added five watts. Yeah, I mean, Maybe. Because HBM is supposed to be lower power than G5X. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Either way, that's where, that's where we're at. So they announced it. Oh, by the way, it's three thousand uh dollars. -huh. I forgot to mention that. Sounds part. like a familiar price. Um, it's the same price as twenty nine ninety nine. Yeah, that they launched, 99. which was their two GPU train wreck. Maxwell part, I think. Kepler was it Kepler? I don't remember what it was. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, it goes through Titan Black. Just from like a productization standpoint, they, there's, the GeForce brand is no longer associated with this. It's just the NVIDIA Titan V. Mm -hmm. Previous, we had the you know, NVIDIA GeForce GTX Titan X, you know, Titan XP, whatever. They had the GeForce brand in it. If yeah, you look at the no, top uh, of it, no... it says Titan up top instead of GeForce up top. Mm -hmm. It also doesn't Wasn't they just call it the Saturn V? That's, that's what I've been wondering. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 But... Um, so they named their server that. To be yeah. fair, to be we did an we did an unboxing, we did a a teardown of this uh, in a video form, which I think you guys should go watch because we, if you've never seen what a what a V100 looks like, GV100 GPU, um, you can get a little bit of a sense here. Let me see if I can. Uh, What's Ryan can I ask you one a, a rather personal oh, wax question? Off. Yes, you may. Uh, when you are rubbing the top of that die, mm -hmm. can you actually feel the edges of the GPU and the? Uh, Memory. I cannot. Or is just the fill is that nicely put in? It's like it's lapped. Yeah, I, I, I would say I mean, that they epoxy. did a very good job yeah. leveling the you know the, the the epoxy or whatever that is between the HBM stacks. Yeah, I mean even the edges of the reflection off the top of it just go smoothly across yeah. the whole thing in a straight line. Oh, that's it's, awesome. It's cool looking. It's cool looking. It's still a graphic card, but it's ain't no like we've seen HBM video cards before from AMD. This is not a new thing for us. Sixteen phase power. Um, you can see actually up top there, uh, I forgot to mention it in the article I just published, but um, if you look, these are NVLink connections, right? So there's no yeah. SLI on Which here. you can barely make out. Yeah, they're not addressable. You can't yeah. plug anything into them in the card, but when you take it apart, you can see the NVLink. So no multi-GPU likely on this. Unless you take it apart and water cool it. Sure. <laughs> you can do multi-GPU. <laughs> but it is $3,000, right? Which is important to note because... Um, your, your gaming performance per dollar is going to be poor. <laughs> Why would they design that PCB with the fingers on it? It had to be a last-minute decision, right? Well, I, mm, I mean... Like they had to design this PCB from scratch because... Careful. It's not a... Maybe oh, yeah. it may not Pick be the final product of this stack. Yeah. 
Is it possible that, that it was the same board that they used for the GV, GV100, like the Tesla 100? No, because there were Quite just possible. outputs on the V1. Sure. Yeah. Like, that requires additional But routing. you could have had, like... If they might have routed it, but then just not connected the connectors at the end, too. I don't know, but it, it's possible either way. I don't know. Uh, $3,000 makes it not a gaming card. There will be people who want to spend the money anyway because maybe they bought Bitcoin at $300 or something. And yeah, there, there are no uh, SLI connectors. Correct. That's what I was talking about. It's NVLink. NVLink replaces SLI on future generations well, of sure. graphics cards. Sure. But you can't do multi-GPU at all. Because there's no, like... Well, and I don't think the driver would support it anyway, that yeah. they allow for it. Um, the, the target of the card, according to NVIDIA, is um, is uh, uh, like developers for machine learning, CUDA applications, uh, AI. What are the other buzzwords that we can use? Um, deep learning. Yeah, deep learning. Neural yeah, nets. Neural net training. Yes, 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 yes. All these things. Very important for that. And it makes sense, right? It's a $3,000 card. Um, they're going to saturate the highest price market they can, and then the next highest price market, and then this market, and then they'll get to the gamers with it, if they even get to gamers with Volta. Um, but what was interesting to us, in the same way we did with the uh, AMD Vega Frontier Edition, we bought way too expensive for video cards for that, in order to test, just to kind of maybe see if we get some idea of what performance is going to look like for uh, consumer cards, if and when they are released. First of all, it is champagne-colored. Yep. Right, so that's nice. It's not like discoloration of your of your screen. Champagne colored. You can see the specs here. Clock speeds are pretty good. You know, they're they're obviously lower than what we've seen on the Titan XP and the GTX 1080 Ti. Ooh, let me scroll down a little bit more there. There we go. Um, in, uh, in in actual testing, we're at about fifteen fifty in terms of frequency. Yep. Uh, sustained. Start. It starts at like seventeen hundred and something, and then it you know kind of comes down as the temperature ramps up. But it stays in, in well into boost. Like yeah, well yeah. above what the rated boost is. It's just three thousand um, dollars. You can see the pictures of the card here. We've been showing it. <coughs> it's also much heavier. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. I have a little bit of cold. Um, the some the some of the initial people who have looked at it have mentioned that like the cooler is the same as the like Titan XP or 1080 Ti. It's not the case. It's actually when you pick up the two cards immediately, you can tell that the the Titan V is heavier mm -hmm. than the X than the Titan XP. Um, they've actually gone with copper fins on the vapor chamber on this as opposed to aluminum fins on the vapor chamber, which is what exists on the Titan XP and the 1080 Ti, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it is a more substantial cooler, um, same fan and, and, and kind of design that way. And you can go through the review and see our, our average clock speed over our heaven run was 1,602 megahertz. Um, what's interesting to look at is like performance, right? So we took it through our normal gaming suite not because you should buy this for your next gaming computer, but because we're just really curious, and we had to spend... I'm going to be clear, NVIDIA did not send us this card. I paid $3,000 on my American Express to have it delivered so that we could do this. And the best part about that is I'm, like, on ramen for the next four months. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I told Josh, I said, I'm going to order this card. I'm sorry about your paycheck. Mm -hmm. And he said, I understand. You, I Josh do. is a great employee. I'm, I'm a giving person that way. Something like that. Um, yeah. So as an example, Fallout 4, older game, um, still better than, even at 25 by 14, you know, the, the green line here is the Titan V, black line's Titan XP, orange line 1080 Ti, you can see that it's better, not by a huge amount, but if you look at 4K, that increases quite a bit. And if we look at this in a table format, it's actually at 4K, which is really where you should be focusing a card of this performance level and, and cost. Yep. Titan V is 20% faster than the Titan XP, 50% faster than the 1080 Ti, and 82% faster than the GTX 1080, 76% faster than the uh, Vega 64, right? So Now, while it, now just, to, just to reiterate, 50% faster than the 1080 Ti, that seems pretty good, except the price. Well, 1080 Ti is $800 <laughs> or $700, yeah. right? So the price is like 200 and something yeah. percent. <laughs> this card's never going to win performance per dollar metrics. That much is pretty obvious. Yeah. But if we just let me just skip down here, you guys can read the review if you want to see all the all the numbers. All right here's an instance again where it's forty to fifty percent faster than a 1080 Ti, thirty to thirty eight percent faster than a Titan XP. You know, almost a hundred percent faster than the 1080. It is a hundred percent faster than the Vega 64 Liquid. Like Actually, this, that's a good gain, even twenty five by yeah, fourteen. It's actually better in a couple of those instances, right? Wow. So it's. Uh, 
its gaming performance is better than I expected. Yeah. I'm going to be honest, right? Because um, if you look at the raw metrics, if you just look at like the teraflops performance, it's not that different than, well, the, than the Titan XP. Also consider, I seriously doubt that that driver is really optimized for gaming on that particular architecture. I don't know, man. You sound like AMD. No, what I'm saying is like, <laughs> so if you, so, I mean, if you're getting in a few games right out of the gate, 50% gains. Right. Right. Stands to reason if they just did some optimizations, you probably see that amount of gain across other titles is my point. Right. Right. Like, you know, like I seriously doubt there was any effort put in to optimize for gaming. I mean, I, I, it depends on how <coughs> close they are to um, consumer productization. Yeah. If, they're, if, if this is something that's going to launch in January for the consumer, mm -hmm. then they're pretty close. Right, same thing with the Frontier Edition going into yeah, yeah. Uh, Vegas 64. But is that stuff actually in the driver today, like as you were doing this testing? I, you know, I, I, mean? I wouldn't, I don't think NVIDIA is going to like the reason I'm bringing this leave up is, stuff out in order to degrade the performance of that sure. so that the consumer ver version looks better. That's not what I mean, but I just mean like typically when you see, you know, when you went from a 1080 to a 1080 Ti, it yeah. was... It was more level across all the games. Like the performance mm -hmm. gain that you got was pretty much roughly the same percent across the board. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one, it's like spotty. Um, yeah, I mean? so, but there's, there's so much more in play here, right? Like there's actually uh, one of the things I'll mention that I don't think I, I didn't mention up front is that if you look at the spec table, one of the things that might stand out to you is we go from uh, 3,840 to 5,120 CUDA cores. Yeah. Right, which is a big increase. But if you look at our ROPs, look at the raster operators. It goes from 96 to 96. So, hmm. that, and that's Could. because of the drop of uh, the memory, right? A full GB100 yeah. has yeah. 128 ROPs. Yeah, is that right? The ROPs are built into yeah. the memory pipeline part of it. More. The ROPs are just in line. Isn't it? No, I guess Whatever 96 divided sorry. by 3 times 4 is. Yep. Yeah. Was that 120? I think that's 120. No, it's 128. 128. I'm um, sorry. My math is poor. Fair. So what you're saying is that could be a form of a bottleneck. It could be a some. bottleneck in some games, mm -hmm. right? Um, fair. You know, so, it, so it's, 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 hard, it's hard to really tell because there's multiple variables that change at the same time, right? Um, you think at 4K it would be a bigger deal? The, the lack you of, know, a, of a like the ROM ratio? Rounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other you're still painting pixels. Yeah. The other interesting thing um, is in the power testing, we did see, it's hard to maybe tell in this graph, but uh, this is kind of a raw data dump. You got to scroll um, over. Yeah, I will. Or shrink it down. The, you can see the scale here on the left where we start out at this point kind of, um, oh, my cursor's not showing up. That's weird. Yeah, the cursor doesn't show up. Um, we're, we're drawing just under 250 watts, but over uh, a not significant time frame you can see out here towards the right it actually we kind of come in at like 200 210 watts it was like a minute yeah um and that's where we get our stable like 1550 megahertz or whatever down from 1700 um that's an unusual thing for me to see mm -hmm. normally you know we run gpus you know we loop them for 30 minutes running our power monitoring and we don't really see it decrease like that mm -hmm. you'll see clocks change as the temperature goes up and the voltage has to go up to, you know, or down to accordingly, right, in order to maintain that 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 thermal level. Yep. Um, here it got up to 84C pretty quick and kind of and kind of dropped down, but it was sustained at that. We got you know the graph stops here, but we saw it go much 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 further than that. Um, so a lot of questions in Nvidia about is this an architectural thing? Is this a cooling thing? Is this you know uh, what we expect from Volta in general? Is this something in our in our I say sample, but in what we bought? Um, we'll see. So uh, that's kind of it for Titan V for now. We're gonna we have another story probably going up tomorrow that will look at compute based stuff. So you know what did we look at? Can we look at uh, spec view perf? We'll look at folding at home. We'll look at some Sysoft Sandra benchmark, single precision, double precision, V Ray. Did we look at V Ray? Yeah. Um, stuff that spoiler is more, alert. It's good at those things. Yeah, like what's yeah. one? Of, what's like, what was like one of the double precision where it was like eight times faster? Yeah, than some other cards. It has an amazing amount of double precision. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder if that's affecting the kind of ROP count to ratio to the amount of shaders. It wouldn't surprise me if, you know, 
if you if you're designing a card for compute and not for gaming, then you don't really care what your ROP ratio is. You right? just disconnect that stuff. Yeah, you just don't have to worry about it. Um, now you don't want to completely destroy it, so so people can still do gaming on it. You're not going to drop it to you know fifty or forty or something like that. Uh, but this this would be an area where you would you could see them cutting because you don't really care about performance in that space. But for compute. You only care about you know the fifty one five thousand one hundred twenty cores, twenty five hundred and sixty uh, FP sixty four core capability, all that stuff. So um, I still think it's possible that the consumer variants of this cars will actually be faster because of ROP increases, memory changes, uh, clock speed improvements. Whereas when we did our Vega Frontier Edition, um, it didn't really have any expectations that it would be better than what it was, and as it turns out, it wasn't. So, I don't know. That's part one of the review. <coughs> part two on compute coming soon. Don't buy this card for gaming um, unless you just have an infinite amount of money and you don't care. It does ship pretty quick. I ordered it. It shipped the same day, and yeah. I got it the next day, right? So, like, that was surprising. Like they've got them in stock. They're There's ready to go. There's one guy on Reddit who bought four of them. Oh, really? There's a guy on Reddit posted a picture of four. You see that image of four oh, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, He's got the meat stack. You know does what it, I'm saying? Does it make a whole lot of sense? It's a lot of money. Hopefully, he's doing something that like he's trying to turn work. on. He's trying to click the SLI button. And he's probably just mining. Let's be honest. Understand why it's not working, right? We he, he's actually using the EMA. We do have do coin SMA. mining in our stuff. Somebody asked me here if we did mining. I think what was we sneak preview? What did it get? Seventy nine mega hashes per second. I mean, what was the? I mean, there's so many different friggin' algorithms like these some. days. It's but difficult I mean, to it quote was a number. Fortunately, better than the 1080 Ti by like was it know, about like 20 percent? Yeah, it wasn't 50 percent. Okay. But none of these algorithms, none of the software is necessarily optimized for that specific right. layout. So, all right. Yeah, shipping was free. That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they gave you free shipping on that three thousand dollar graphics card. Yeah, it's nice. Nice. All right, so that is uh, that's a Titan V. That's what we got. Uh, a couple of real quick things. Can you took a look at some Corsair like add-on keycaps? These are they're called Corsair Gaming PBT, which is a type of plastic uh, double shot keycaps. And other than being sexy white, which is my nickname in high school, mm -hmm. uh, what what pale. what stands out with these? I think you pretty much just said all there is to say. Uh, no, but they're... So in the enthusiast mechanical keyboard world, people know about different types of switches. You got your blues, your reds, your blacks, your alp switches, your tilt your switches, your whatever the hell switches. And that's more of an accepted thing in the mainstream now that there are these different switch types and different advantages to each. Sure. However, the more niche part of the market are keycaps. Mechanical keyboard communities go crazy over all sorts of different keycaps, whether they're artisanal made custom keycaps with someone's like molding clay and like putting it on the keycap <laughs> to make a cool design. Nice. Or in are this there case, any that are GMO? Exactly. GMO keycaps. <laughs> That's my new startup. Find us on Kickstarter. <laughs> Only half joking. Yeah, free. Just, just, just a little bit. Uh, but in this case, these are keycaps made of PBT plastic. Your standard keycaps for just about any mechanical keyboard Fair you keys. buy will be made out of ABS plastic, mm -hmm. which is a very utilitarian plastic. It's in a lot of crap. It's what they use for the majority of injection molding in the world. And it has its advantages and disadvantages. It's really easy to work with. It can be cheap. However, it's extremely susceptible to UV damage, and it's a fairly brittle plastic, okay. which in the doesn't mean a whole lot, but... PBT is a more durable plastic that's harder to work with, so generally a more premium option. Right. Does now, it change what, any of the It changes the feel. The it absolutely does. changes okay. the feel. And it's difficult to describe how it changes, but I prefer the feel of key, PBT keycaps. It doesn't make them quieter or no, anything like that, it's just, right? Yeah. It's kind of like the surface has a different feeling, and they're yeah. just kind of more solid when you clink down on them. I know Ken point or uh, well, I think you pointed out, and Alan pointed out, too, that the... They cut larger uh, openings for the light to come through on these keys, right? Like the there's letters, more translucent the are, on the letter. Yeah, the lettering is more is bolder. Yeah, you can see through more. So there's this picture here that, that Ken took. If it's hard to see without like a side by side, but 
more of the color comes through on these. Yeah. That's what you're, when it's dark, yeah, it's, you're it's for. easier to read, and when it's dark. And, and it's kind of leading into that, like the the legend on the keys, the actual letter outline. Uh, these are, as Corsair normally does, they're double shot keycaps, right? Which means that the legend is a separate injection mold pool as the exterior plastic, and instead of just printing on the label on the keycaps or laser etching it which could feel weird or like if you just print them on there, they can rub off. We've all had keyboards where the, the mm-hmm. legends have started to rub off. I'm sure. So yeah, the, the whole key is the solid color. Yeah. And so if you scroll up, Ryan, oh, yeah. sorry. you and can the, actually the part, the part of it you scroll is... up to the like bunch of keycaps. No, up a little more. This? So that that's example of double shot. So you can see in most like in the one in the top middle, you can see the white is the legend. That's one plastic pool. And then the green is the rest of the key. Yeah, and it's a more advanced process. Corsair does this on all of their normal keycaps, anyways, for the most part that I've seen. Okay, at least on their RGB key co- keyboards. But it's a sign of quality for the mechanical keycap world. Mm-hmm. And it makes the edges of the lettering sharper because it's literally there was a mold that the color yeah. plastic had to go around the you know the edges of whatever mm-hmm. the letter was, right? Mm-hmm. And then you know, and then you the second shot would be the clear. In the center, as yeah. an example, if they were backlit, keys, and if right? you rub your you rub your finger over the key, you can't feel like the indentation of where the letter A is. It's yeah. all smooth, which is nice for typing. Right. How much do these cost? Do you know, these are fifty dollars, which is yeah. steep. You for can get comparable stuff from just kind of generic Chinese vendors but, for, but it's artisanal. Yeah, for fifteen to twenty five ish on Amazon. I mean, they're really nice. Yeah. I, I like them. I don't think I'd ever spend fifty dollars on them, but yeah, you know, if you're if you're into that, they're also available in black, by the way. So if you don't want the Got contrasting it. look, they also come in black. Can can you get them naked? No, you can't get them naked. Oh, well, if you have an RGB keyboard, <laughs> oh. it defeats a lot of the purpose. Uh, naked means no letters. No letters. You want swatch keys? No. Okay. Also, or replacing like keycaps on a keyboard is a pain in the ass. I mean, so is it a pain or is it just like it's tedious? Painful. It's time consuming. It's, yeah. it's a pain. Do you take them all off at once and then try to memorize where each key goes? Well, <laughs> or do you do that's it more one fun. at a time? I mean, I took them off all at once because the way the packaging actually ships, they're all in order. So uh, if you scroll down to that photo, yeah, it's actually really, it can be a really mindless task because it's in the exact oh, so order. They're free range. They're actually boxed up. Eh? Yeah. Which is, it's just yeah, definitely Ken nice. Ken didn't, Ken didn't put this, this uh, uh, ordering and, and, uh, stuff together. He didn't. He didn't set it up. This oh God, for the no. photo. All right, that is the Corsair Gaming PBT Double Shot Keycaps. Uh, we also saw uh, the launch of AMD's next annual release driver. This one is Adrenaline, without an E at the end, meaning it is still a color red because it is the Adrenaline Rose. Mm-hmm. Um, but not- they're marketing it as blue. Like, uh, well, no, a that's lot, in the a lot pro. of the graphics and stuff are blue. In the pro stuff, it is. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to spend is a whole lot of time on this. the greatest software update of all time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stop that. you. Uh, it's, I'm I mean, going to let you finish. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, anyway. Um, wow, it's really windy out there. You hear that? Yeah. yeah. The world's Jeez. probably ending out there. I don't know if we get to see Star Wars. <sighs> It's snowing. Here. Anyway, uh, so this is their annual release. This is kind of their supposed to be their big annual kind of software update. It's got some interesting features. There, there is a video here uh, where we had the AMD guys out for a interview slash Q and A slash demo. So I would highly check you guys. Highly encourage you to check that out. The two is the two big features are they introduced the Radeon overlay, which is a way to access many driver settings, including uh, Radeon Relive. Um, uh, monitoring system and GPU monitoring capabilities, uh, free sync, enhanced sync, uh, things like that. You can uh, ready on chill. You can turn on and off and play with. But you hit all. You're in the game and you hit Alt R and it brings up an overlay on the right hand side of the screen. Right, so it kind of looks like this. Right, this this is not just like a, a a mock up in a PDF. This this shows up on the side of your screen on top of the game. On top of the game. Doesn't pause the game. The game's still running in the background, so don't do this when you're when you're in the middle of a firefight. Um, but it allows you, like, hey, do you want to turn on these metrics, right? And then this overlay will stay on top of the game. You know, left, right, corner, up, down, whatever you want to. You know, you can decide where to put it and which items you want to put on there. 
monitor your clock speed, your frame rate, GPU utilization and power and, and all that type of stuff. Um, you can do all that without ever leaving, leaving the game. You can change your relive settings. You can go into uh, you know, viewing your clips, editing, cropping them, maybe not cropping them, editing them, clipping them, uploading them to social channels, all that stuff without ever leaving the game. It's actually really cool and it works very well, very smooth, very uh, seamless. Um, and it just makes sense that that would be the next thing you would do to, to improve kind of an interface for that. They also released AMD Link, which is a mobile app for your phone. Uh, iOS or Android is supported. This basically allows you to, to do, you can do the performance monitoring, you can uh, check your recordings and screenshots that you take through AMD Relive. Um, you can get notifications from AMD when there's driver updates, news, that type of stuff. I, I think it's neat. I think the amount of people that actually will use AMD Link is pretty small compared yeah. to the Radeon Overlay, which I think will get a lot of use mm -hmm. from uh, people playing games. Even if you just use it to enable the monitoring stuff, it's just neat to have there. I would like to see them add you know, overclocking in that overlay as well. Um, they updated other stuff, right? So they, um, you know, frame rate target control now supports Vulkan. Um, Adia, the Radeon Wattman now supports profiles. So you can save profiles to files, you know, on, on, the, on disk, save them, share them, reload them if your system crashes and resets it all, that type hmm. of stuff. That's something people have been asking for. Um, there's a gallery to go through your relive, so you can do simple modifications. Um, it even has, you know, they do roll off of things like, hey, if you do these recordings, they will let you record two separate audio tracks, one with the game audio, one with your microphone audio. That's handy. Which is, if you go in and edit these after the fact, you can adjust volumes and levels and stuff independently. Super nice. Yeah, because otherwise you have to have that, like, perfect from yeah. the get-go. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, enhanced Sync now is, uh, will work on all GCN-based products. Vulkan support is added for it. Multi-GPU, Ifinity. Uh, what was the other thing they added that I'm, I'm missing? What was there was there was a third thing that I was forgetting that I'm forgetting about? Mobile um, app? No. The stage ten. Stage itself? ten is in there. Uh, enhanced sync. Uh, it changed radio, chill. Radio, oh, chill. Radeon chill. They added a global enable for Radeon chill. So it does not. It's it's a it's a black list rather than a white list now. So. If there's some game that they know has a compatibility issue, they will not enable that by default, but you can enable chill and see if the power saving capability is something that you want to take advantage of. And because that works in the overlay, you can actually go in, turn it on, see if it affects your gameplay, mm -hmm. um, you know, monitor GPU power while you're doing that through the overlay. It's actually pretty, it's a, it's a pretty, good, pretty good way of doing things. So that's Adrenaline. It's available now. I would encourage you guys to go watch the video that we posted with them. It's, it's actually super useful. Uh, and I think for Radeon users, it is, it's a pretty nice feature upgrade that you get for free, right? There's no cost to that. Um, and so I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what they continue to do. I think there's a lot of ways for them to improve all of those things, actually to make them even better. Hopefully not, hopefully before we get to all the way to next year, maybe in the mid-year, mid-year bump. Uh, I think before we move on, a couple things. One, we have a new patron from Mutation666. Pledge $3. Thank you, the Mutation. Uh, and Russell Pate just pledged $3. So thank you guys very much, new contributors to uh, the Patreon campaign. Definitely love it. All right, let's quickly take a short break here. We have uh, a sponsor for today's podcast. That would be our friends at HelloFresh. DC Perspective has teamed up with the HelloFresh team as they are offering everyone in our audience $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use offer code PCPER30. Now, HelloFresh, if you're not familiar, is a, it's a food delivery service, but they don't just send you a pizza. They actually send you the ingredients for food, which maybe at first you think like, well, that doesn't sound nearly as convenient. And I guess it's not as convenient as ordering a pizza, but it's way better food, and you get to do a lot of cool stuff, right? So... Um, it's the convenience of getting good food and ingredients delivered without having to go to the grocery store. You choose your delivery day that works for you. You can pause it on weeks when you're going to be out of town. Like That's important to know for the holidays. So you can still sign up today and not worry about, oh, I don't want to sign up yet because I'm going to have to miss Christmas or New Year's or something like that. You could be able to pause on individual weeks. Everything that you get, all the ingredients come pre-measured uh, and labeled meal kits so you know which ingredients go with each recipe. 
having tried two of these different services before, I can tell you the convenience of having everything in one bag as opposed to you getting one bag with everything in it is actually pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, it's delivered right to your door in an insulated, recyclable package. Another cool thing about it is you get a lot of selection and flexibility with HelloFresh. Um, uh, it offers a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly. You can get three plans, classic, vegetarian, family. Uh, classic is, you know, standard meat, fish, seasonal produce, veggies. Obviously, vegetarian recipes, families, stuff that maybe is a little bit more kid-friendly mm -hmm. those are in those regards. Uh, very nice to have as somebody who, you know, my wife and I are – are guilty of eating the same dinner meals over and over and over again because we're just like, ah, I don't know what I'm going to cook. Uh, how about spaghetti? Okay, good. You move on. This actually introduces that variability into, into the meals. It's actually super nice. Um, we, we, we have used HelloFresh. It's actually a, a super convenient thing. You, you, you learn how to cook. It's kind of fun, right? I didn't think it was going to be fun to cook. It's not something that I ever kind of processed in my mind, but it actually is. And you, and you learn while you go. You get to keep the recipe books that they send you, right? So if there's something you want to make later that maybe they didn't send you that week or you can't request specifically, you can go out and actually, if you want to suffer through and go to the grocery store and buy stuff, you can do that. Um, you won't spend all night in the kitchen because recipes only take about 30 minutes. There's a lot of one-pot recipes for speedy cooking, and each week there's even a 20-minute meal on the classic menu. So if you go to HelloFresh.com and use the code PCPER30, you get $30 off your first week of deliveries. That's a significant dollar amount, $30 off your first week. So HelloFresh.com, use the code PCPER30, and we thank HelloFresh for their support of the PC Perspective Podcast. Thanks, guys. You know, that, that came out a lot, whole lot better than I expected because when you first said HelloFresh, I thought <clears throat> someone's talking about my body odor. No, and this is going to cover it all. We'll get a different sponsor right. for that at, at yeah, you know a later time. Nobody makes. But if I can nobody get thirty makes bucks off work. a week, if you need enough deodorant, then work. you're spending thirty dollars a week. Sometimes he just doesn't feel fresh. That's a not so fresh feeling. You hey, look, say. he's got his Star exactly. Wars shirt on today too. Good job, Jeremy. I didn't yep. notice before. Yeah, is that the uh, one with the uh, sort of the Rebel logo up. and the Empire logo cut in half? Yep. Where did we get that? I have that shirt. Humble Bundle. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was with our Humble Bundle thing. Yeah. All right, let's get to some news items today. Toshiba launching a 14-terabyte helium-sealed hard drive. What's PMR? Parallel or perpendicular. Perpendicular. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's been around for a while. Okay. There's nothing special about that. Okay. Now, squeezing nine platters into a drive with less than two millimeters between each one and somehow fitting, that's new. fitting the head pack between those as well is new. Had we hit eight platters before? I think so, yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. So um, they had to, obviously this is a helium drive, which was one of the hurdles that Toshiba had to get over because Toshiba hadn't been shipping helium drives. Okay. Right, so once they got there, they were able to add more platters. and But that's uh, really, uh, that's pretty dense for a hard disk by today's standards. And it's not a SMR, it's not a shingled drive. It's not doing any tricks with overlapping sectors to be able to get that density. So would we expect this to be a normal performance hard drive then? Because you, when you get yeah. into shingle, obviously it's lower performance on the writes. Yeah. And it's usually only used for like long-term storage and enterprise workloads. If you wanted to, could you buy this for a consumer machine? Yeah. Even though it is an inter, you know, enterprise it would It drive? would work like a regular drive. Okay. Just make sure uh, you should probably get, I mean, you're going to be basically be ordering an enterprise product and putting it in a, like, you're right. not going to see this, like, on a Best Buy shelf. Got it. Right. Um, and for those considering that, because you, if you absolutely positively want 14 terabytes in your... Absolutely, always you know, do. Um, make sure you get the uh, 512E model, which is basically, it's 4K native sectors in, internally in the drive. But when you start ordering enterprise hard drives, some of them present themselves as 4K sector. Mm. devices, where hmm. what you really want for proper, I don't want to say proper, but like more likely fully compatible with everything you could possibly plug it into, Sure, you want 512E, which emulates single sector being 512 bytes each. Got That's it. what the E is for. It's emulating, you know, the drive internally is still 4K. That's actually how they've been for since advanced format came out with Western Digital, which is like, I don't know, eight, seven years ago or something crazy okay. like that, right? 
Um, but just remember, with Enterprise Drive, you can actually buy them where the, the 4K sectors is presented to the host. Right. So it might not work right for you. Tim wrote up as well, does anybody care that Apple bought Shazam? I um, just kind of wonder why the hell. It's not really Apple style to buy someone instead of just ripping them off. Oh, uh, they do. I mean, the superhero <laughs> movies coming out, so, so they want the name. <laughs> well, I mean, Shazam already has integrated, like, if you used it on an iPhone... Like you can Shazam the track, and then if you have Apple Music, you can just right. hit the thing right out of Shazam. Siri has a feature that is. is and it'll, and it'll listen. Yeah. But do you I think, think they're there just was, using. Do you think they were going to get like sued by some patents that Shazam had? And they said, how about instead? I mean, and just buy your ass. I feel like Apple would spend $400 million, million, million dollars money. worth of lawsuits, yeah. countersuits, instead of. $400 million is a huge, a huge. Maybe amount. they're working on some AI <laughs> stuff like. A, personal assistant stuff that is actually good unlike Siri sharing a passion for music discovery and delivering great music experiences to our users there's also like a show a TV show based on Shazam now and stuff so they're getting more than there's a what like, isn't, isn't that the name I of have the show? no idea what the hell you're talking can you, about can you beat Shazam or some crap or something I, like that oh is that a thing okay no it's a thing are you sure yeah. you're not talking about the 70s superhero on CBS Saturday no, morning no that's not the show the I'm talking power about. hour with Shazam, Shazam. no but there's a uh, you know I mean I'm just saying there's there's more around that name now which is why the, the dollar value of the purchase might be so high right it's not just an app anymore there's more stuff that they do I don't know. I think it's weird. Shazam is an app that uh, I remember when it first came out. I thought it was the most magical thing I've ever it was. There was seen. A, there was a white paper on it that was like amazing to even read because nobody thought that that was even possible to. You know, it was it, it was a white files. paper that described how it it's did. It's basically what like it did. Shazam led to content ID on YouTube. Essentially, well, right? in, like, in that respect, idea. it sucks. But uh, no, no, I'm not know. saying that in a negative. I'm just saying like they created this thing, this idea that you could somehow. Fingerprint audio, yeah, just from any portion, and easily search against it, mm-hmm. right? Which is which is what it was, right? Because it had to happen near instantly from the time it took the sound sample to when you got the answer yeah. back is seconds. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't just. And now I can't tell you the last time I even bothered to open up Shazam. It wasn't just. It wasn't installed. just a fingerprint. It was a fingerprint that you could use any small portion of and still tell mm-hmm. that it was the thing, right? That I was mean, the key. but yeah, Kim was right. Like Siri has this integrated to it. I think Google. Assistant has it center. You can just say like uh, on the new Pixel phones, like you could have your you can have your Pixel two or Pixel two XL sitting on a table, and it will, will automatically identify the song playing without you asking it, without it hitting the internet. They've implemented a local wow version. Of really, it. that's really cool. Yeah. So it's always really? listening. Yeah, it is always listening. What memory does that? Uh, I imagine. It doesn't take a lot. Of, like this Let me tell you about machine very, learning and neural net problems. I mean, it does hit I'm the internet. You, but you're you're but. saying it can figure it out? Yeah. Without? I don't think it has every song in it like Shazam does, but it has. Probably has like the top. Like it has. You know, top, top billion. I mean, if you think about. This was the top billion If you think about the actual. Million, but, if you think uh, about the actual data that is the fingerprint, it's not a lot. probably not a lot. Yeah. 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 That's true. To match it against a database yeah. of other fingerprints. Yeah. Interesting yeah. stuff. Um. Maybe more interesting for the phone, I think at least. Synaptics is unveiling, uh, or they did unveil, Clear ID, which is an in-display fingerprint sensor technology. I, I think there was a There's device that really needed this. Yeah, yeah. At some point recently. Yeah, there was a lot of patents Nody. about it. And there was yeah, all the these Nody, news the stories phones. about this thing, like potentially doing it. Yeah. So Synaptics is one of those companies that literally uh, has its finger on everything. <laughs> But you don't know their name, probably. Synaptics makes, I don't know, what the enormous percentage of the touchpads for your laptops. The good touchpads, yeah. Right. right. And they do a bunch of the te- touch technologies that exist in phones and tablets as well. This just being a new one. So the basic idea is there is a fingerprint reader underneath the screen, underneath the glass, but is transparent and works through the OLED screen. Hmm. Right? Now, it's not the whole screen. It is still a section of the screen, uh, but it actually goes from, I think there's a diagram. It goes through the OLED matrix. It's behind the OLED, and it has to do, uh, what do they say, it's signal processing because it has to see through the OLED the matrix. The grid of yeah. the, yeah. Wow. Right. And uh, I could see this being very useful. So you had an iPhone, or any phone really, that had like a facial recognition that uh-huh, uh-huh. maybe you personally weren't very happy with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, 
this might be cool because you can have both and you don't have to worry about, like obviously the, the key here is, is they're trying to adapt to the idea of bezel-less phones, you know, where there's no space for a home button or something like that and the inconvenience of maybe having one on the back that you can't see. Yeah. Or maybe you have one in both places now. You have the front, you have the back. Um, so basically how it works is, is you can kind of see it there, uh, when an operating system would ask for ID, it illuminates on the screen where you should put your thumb. With the OLEDs? Yeah. Ha. <laughs> right? So That's they can funny. put that square, you know, you know, off center, left, right, or, you know, wherever on yeah, the screen, but you want it to be is, convenient. Right. So, like, it illuminates, so it reminds you where to put your finger, and you put it there, it reads it, and you move on. Yeah. They're going to demo this at CES, I, I wonder think. what the hit rate of, like, you know, because Touch ID came a long way. Yeah. And it's, I, I would it's assume really it's pretty good, way. right? And so they had some slides in their deck about, you know, the average... Uh, face ID takes 1.4 seconds. Mm-hmm. The average of their technology for fingerprint takes 0.7 seconds. 0.7? Yeah. So I don't know what that, how that compares to what Touch ID did or not. Uh, on that's, Apple, that's slower than Touch ID. Is it right might now. be. But it's, it's probably doing more processing in order yeah, it to... Has to... It has to try to reconstruct your fingerprint by yeah. looking at it through a, a grid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is But they still tricky. claim it's, it's as secure or more secure oh, sure, than the other sure. stuff. So I'm really interested to see this. I'm sure um, Apple wishes it existed six months prior. Uh, maybe. All right. Um, I mean, but that would be my guess as to the first major customer. It'll probably be in the Galaxy S9, if I'm guessing. Like the, the next Samsung will have it, and it'll be, oh, look, Samsung could do what Apple couldn't. And Apple's just like, no. Mm. We tried. We were, we were too fast getting our iPhone 10 out to market. And then they'll keep cashing our checks. Yeah, I don't think they'll be sad for long. Uh, Vesa. Visa. In, Visa introduces new fully open display HDR standard for LCD displays. I don't. I didn't see this at all. Anybody want to explain this to me? What the hell is happening? There's display HDR 400, 600, 1,000. I'm guessing that's brightness levels. Probably. No. <laughs> no. Scroll down to the chart. No. Okay. There's a chart. All right. It's nope. No, no chart. No chart. There's a chart in there. Hmm. Well, is it dynamic? What the chart would say. I don't. Quite remember it says HDR 400 represents minimum entry level tier of HDR per Visa specification, and oh. it specifies that an LCD display must feature at least a 400 nit brightness, both short, local burst, and full screen flashes, 8 bit color, HDR 10, and global dimming. Okay, so but HDR 1000 displays must achieve 10 bit mm-hmm. using 8 bit panels combined with 2 bit dithering at a minimum, and 600 as well. 600, 600. and 1000 okay. have to be 10 bit mm-hmm. or 8 bit dithered to 10. Got it. I've seen a but lot the nice of thing these. about this is it ahead, stops Jimmy. the the pretend HDR ones. Yeah, uh, like the they're like six bit, but they they fake it so that it looks like eight bit, and the local dimming isn't as good. So you run into the you buy an HDR TV, and you're like, oh, I'm excited about HDR, and you don't notice a damn thing because it's not actually a proper HDR TV. Mm. So hopefully these ones will start showing up soon, and you'll actually know what you're buying. I feel like they still made a mistake by trying to combine two parts of the thing yes. into one thing because you're going to have sets that can be 10-bit but or like like LCDs, for example, like, a, like desktop displays. Maybe not necessarily TVs, okay. right? But you'll have desktop displays that can only do 200 or maybe 400 nits or something like that, but they could very well be a 10-bit panel. And then another HDR. HDR has a high importance mm-hmm. on brightness. I understand. Like... They're, then they're just 10-bit panels. Run them in 10-bit yeah. on your graphics card. There, there is a ton of confusion still. And actually, when we were at our Qualcomm meetings, yeah. right, we had a lot of talks about this. There's still too much confusion about what the hell HDR even means. HDR, in and of itself, isn't a definition of shit, right? It's yeah. just higher than it used to be, right? Yeah. Like, it's high <laughs> dynamic range. There are only three protocols for HDR. Right, HDR10, Dolby three. Vision, and... Hybrid Log Gamma. Hybrid Log Gamma, which sounds way cooler. Yeah, it does. I mean, I guess my point there is, like, an HDR TV with the brightness turned down a little bit is still an HDR TV. Yeah, I don't TV. think you get to control the brightness. Like, I don't think you can turn the brightness down all the way, and when it goes to HDR mode, the brightness will stay down all the way. I think you lose brightness know. control when you go into HDR mode. You would think there'd have You'd to have be to have some brightness. relative brightness control, right? So uh, that you Otherwise, you got dark room versus room full of sunlight. Yeah, How do you adjust there'd the have TV? to be something. I understand that, like, what you're, I think what you're trying to say is, like, there has, the, the TV needs to maintain some, um, the range. 
Yeah, like a, 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 a gap between the high and the low in order to keep its HDR state, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, what this is trying to do is give us a little bit more definition of that. I just don't feel like, I think we're getting like, everybody else is creating standards. What was the one we heard at, at Qualcomm? UHD Premium? Ultra HD Premium is one as well, which is 4K plus other stuff, yeah. like plus extra color depth, whatever, right? And then you have FreeSync 2, which is like, you have to have 125% of the color uh, uh, capability of Adobe RGB or sRGB or something like that, right? And we just, it's just, it's never materialized, so who did that? Tim's been busy. Intel sheds more light on the benefits of Nirvana Neural Network Processor. Here's something else using HBM. Josh, what do you know about Nirvana? The chip, not the band. It smells like deep learning. Mm. <laughs> anything anything yeah. interesting? <laughs> nice. um, That's good. It's, it's essentially a I think it's a, a tensor unit. Yeah. It's not highly programmable, but it's wide. Yeah. It's got HBM memory. It's at a higher uh, process node than you would expect, like 20 nanometer, 32, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, it looks it's neat heavy duty on this module. in what it does. Oh, right. Have you seen the photos of the dev board? It looks crazy. Really? Like, like there were. They were showing it off at some show recently, and just like the dev, like I don't know if it was the dev board or the final board, just like it's got all these weird connectors on it. It just like looks like a cool futuristic add-in card. The interesting thing that they did here, and, I, and I'm curious to see what this turns into in terms of uh, like success, is they introduced the what do they call it? The flex point, right? Flex point mm -hmm. math, which is a new. It's like someplace, but it's it's not single precision. It's not double precision. It's Oh, yeah. Flexible yeah. and in between, right? Um, they call it unprecedented levels of parallelism with the 10x state of the art and low power per tensor operation, right? And I don't, there's a white paper that came out that I haven't had a chance to read yet about what FlexPoint attempts to do. And it seems to me, and I might be wrong on this, that it is like a dynamic precision mm -hmm. data point that adjust based on the precision that the end result needs and it thus puts less pressure on the processing units when it can or whatever. It's like on the fly variable precision math. Is that okay. So that was that was the intent that was, that was the, what, what I, I got from reading like the synopsis of yeah. the white paper without really diving into it. Um, yeah it's kind of fixed point with some extra mantissa thrown in okay. when it needs it. It's it's a little bizarre. I still haven't wrapped my head around it and I'm probably describing it wrong. I mean, but uh, what's interesting is that it's uh, got an interesting cache structure so that the sensor point, uh, uh, units are not mm. totally going into the HBM memory all the time. Got it. And so it's, it's very localized and apparently efficient, but it all depends on the programming. Yeah, it all depends on your workload and everything else. What I find interesting in this is like, so this is... This is clearly a very different path than building a GP, GPU for, for that stuff, right? So, you know, Intel makes the announcement. Nirvana has been announced for a little while. They acquired this company. Um, and then they acquire Raja Kaduri, uh, more or less, <laughs> and uh, boldly make the claim that they're going to make discrete GPUs and um, compete in discrete and machine learning and all those other type of stuff with it. Meanwhile, there's a big debate about if you look at the financial world and stuff, like are GPUs going to be used for machine learning for the foreseeable future? Because, it, or are ASICs and dedicated hardware, our tensor core is going to take over everything. Um, so it, it's still an interesting debate to look at. But I, I need to I need to look more into the into the Lakecrest stuff, which is the code name for Nirvana, I believe. Um, yeah, they have. I mean, proprietary interchip links that are up to twenty x faster than PCIe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, lanes of PCIe, but, you know, whatever. Uh, I assume it's lane-to-lane -lane kind of differentiation. So uh, pretty cool. Uh, excited to learn more about this stuff and uh, how it will kind of fold into Intel's plans. Because right now, that's where they're getting their lunch eaten. Stolen. This is where people are stealing their lunch money. NVIDIA is stealing their lunch money yes. in the machine learning side of things, right? That's... 
That's where NVIDIA's profits are skyrocketing. So. Oh, you're going to pick on someone, why not the rich kid? Uh, true, yeah. I mean, that's what you, and Intel has been that rich kid for a long time. So if anything, they know, they know what to look for. Yeah, uh, the underdog of NVIDIA. What's that? The underdog of NVIDIA. Yeah, I know. They the, know exactly when someone is stealing their pennies. <laughs> HP has had a keylogger discovered and has since patched uh, in over 460 laptop models. Oh, and the software that came with them? I assume so. Well, yeah. that's yep. new, that new meaning to the crapware. Uh, while delving into the Synaptics touchpad software in an attempt to change the backlight behavior of the keyboard, the keylogger was reportedly built into the software stack to debug errors. While it shipped to customers disabled by default, an attacker that was able to achieve administrative privileges could change the appropriate registry value and enable keylogging to locally record all the user's keystrokes without their knowledge. Mm-hmm. Further malicious code or local physical access could then be used to retrieve data for analysis of possible passwords, usernames, account numbers, and other personal information. Okay. So this is like... It was a keylogger not enabled. Somebody had to be had to add admin privileges to your machine, yeah, yeah, yeah. change a registry key, and then they had to be able to get physical access or further... Uh, uh, no, because it saves to a file. Sure. Right. But yep. it's like further malicious code or physical access could then be used to retrieve the data. Yeah, because now yeah. they're keylogging all your passwords. Yeah, you would need more. You would need more code to actually pull the file off of. Right. This. Yeah. Right. Sure, but at the same point, so it's not like, like it was. What I was what I was trying to say, it's not like HP was sending all of your keystrokes no. to their servers. Right? But if you were nope. an attacker, an attacker looking for a vector on this machine, and you wanted to get a keylogger on for some reason, like, and they had antivirus software that would detect a keylogger that you installed That's on true. it. However, this is a native keylogger you can install that no software would, yeah. would flag yeah. or that sure. you could enable. Yeah. Fair. Uh, so they have patched it that. It also means you could update the touchpad software and have it enabled by default. True. Sure. And yes, it was in the Star Wars laptop, by the way. Wait, Star Wars laptop was Lenovo. Wasn't it? Apparently HP made one. Oh, HP made one too? Yep, HP made one. You're thinking of the yoga special. I, I was, yeah. Empire invading your crap. Man, oh man. You know. What will the world come to? Uh, our last bit of news, never heard of this company before, John's Bow launches a ribbed UX, UMX 500 mid-tower case with RGB LEDs. It's got a sweet vase in the picture with it. I put this in there just because it looks kind of cool and the company's name is John's Bow. <laughs> never heard of it. because if they call themselves Johnson, it would be too obvious. Yeah, yeah scroll down for your building scroll pleasure. Down, scrolling down, scrolling down. Ooh. Look at those LEDs. All right, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, the the front of it again reminds me of a Silverstone case. Mm-hmm. He looks to Josh to see if it's within. Re- no, um, I don't have anything in ten reach. What there. were those called? Those weren't Ravens. These were. Um, I don't remember, but the, the Silverstones Julie? were always like full aluminum and all that type of stuff. So the front IO looks a little Mac Pro. Yeah. Yeah. You can set case ID or case LEDs to color change through 264 colors. Okay. Odd, but all right. 264 uh, 264 colors? 264 colors is what it says. I don't know if it's a typo. Probably not. They're counting. Maybe they're not counting black. Oh, yeah. That's probably true. It's off, so we can't call that a color. Yeah, but that's, it, but it's black. that's probably true. I tried fair. setting my hue lights to black the other day using the Amazon Echo and it didn't work. I was what did it do? It just said, I can't set that color. It just said no you thanks. You just turn them off. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, MSRP of about 200 bucks US. Um, not available anywhere in the US, but it should arrive shortly. There's a lot of cases that, that are released for PCs, guys. I don't know if you knew this. Mm. Maybe, maybe he says there are too many cases being released. Any thoughts? No? No? And he clicks as he Ask opens Sebastian. Up really? You took, you took Authy from me? Happily. I took Happily. it from you. That's fine. How did I Excess take that from you? Excess is never enough. I was trying to think of stuff. Well, I didn't know you were going to... Anyway, hardware software picks of the week. We're going to skip me and go straight to Jeremy. Wanker. Who has a pick. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'm looking. And I've hmm? I've got it. Go ahead. You're good. Okay. Tell me what you got. All right. Uh, just a decent deal on a uh, Ryzen 7 1700 up here in uh, Canada. 50 bucks off. 390 bucks with the Wraith cooler. 
I think you're looking at the American one. Uh, I just clicked the link. No, this is CDN. CDN 435, free shipping. No, no mine, mine says 389. All right, well, whatever. Maybe they don't give me real. I guess Canadian they're trying to stalk you here. from. Uh, well, there's 19 new from Canadian 375. Discounts. Fair enough. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There we go. A Kenai. A Kenai. There you go. There's a nine the from Amazon.ca. There we go. All right. Yeah. I don't know why I wouldn't have picked that one to begin with. But uh, yeah. what are you going to do? A fairly decent deal if you're uh, building an AMD system for the holidays. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Who's next? Josh? Sure. What do you got? I've only like used the previous version of this for the past five years. It's the what C922 Logitech webcam. This is the C922X Pro. Correct. You can do all kinds of things like green screen and yeah, yeah, 1080p. Yeah. I will say there's not really a difference between that and the C920, which Josh is using, and you can catch a C920 mm-hmm. for like 50 bucks. Yeah, it's really just added Sometimes. software, yeah. I think, to the uh, it is. But hey, there was a sale on it for uh. 50 bucks off that? I mean, the sensor Not might be... Not long ago? You know, it's been a few years. The sensor might be... Uh, no, really? Same exact sensor? Because they've had, like, the business <laughs> version of the 922 was, the, for a while. The business version was just a wider angle lens. Yeah, but it wasn't a yeah. different sensor. So I don't think they... I'm just saying, like, it doesn't have to be higher resolution. Right. Maybe the sensor's more sensitive in low light, maybe? I, I, it's the same sensor. Dude, you're, you're all just shitting on my pick, so... No, no, no. no I'm saying it's a good pick. Yeah, whatever. Background replacement technology for YouTube or Twitch streaming. Mm-hmm. Josh's favorite. All right, Alan, You'd what do we got? Be amazed. Uh, so I used to use the Google Authenticator Take thing all the time for uh, two-factor. So soft. Right? And then uh, I think it was a few weeks ago, Ken suggested. It was me. yesterday. I didn't suggest it. To, you didn't suggest it yesterday. I did in this office. office. Yeah, I did in this office. Oh, That's sorry. what I signed up for. Well, you brought it up to me like... Mm few weeks ago or something, and it's uh, auth- called Authy. So the idea is that, like, you know, if you're using Authenticator, unless you're careful, like, some of the some of the sites where you set up two-factor, depending on the site, some of them give you this, the key for the two-factor, mm-hmm. and say, look, you need to save this, because this is the only way you're going to be able to disable two-factor in the future. Right. Because it's two-factor, we don't want to let you get around it. Well, what happens if you... It's true. What happens if you lost your phone? And now you're trying to recreate all your two-factor things... Now you're potentially stuck trying to convince what if you upgrade this, your phone? Uh, same thing. I think same thing. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah, think I, I can say even that for you, certain. Yeah. Yep. So, so like it's it's better to have something that can save the keys somehow, yep. right? Um, and Authy actually does that and is able to even cloud sync across devices. You have to have a master password set in order to encrypt right. the, the encryption. The, the keys that are associated with all of your two-factor tokens, right? Yep. So it gets kind of complicated, but there is at least a way to have it on multiple things and not have to manually set up two-factor on each one individually, which is just like a huge pain in the butt. Sure. And some of those sites don't even give you the keys up front, so you couldn't even you know, save some of those offline if you wanted to, to be able to recreate them later. So, yeah, just Authy seems like a way easier way to do that and... From everything I've seen of it, it looks. People, people have audited it. You know, it, does, it looks secure the way that they're doing. You know, they're sure. Even though you're syncing your two factor to the cloud, it seems counterintuitive. You might think that, it does. Oh no, somebody <laughs> can get my stuff. Well, just make sure you don't use that same. Don't use one two three as your freaking password for. Yeah, I know your smile just went away. Don't use one <laughs> two three as your password to encrypt all of your things. Can I use two factor to log into Authy? Get two-factor. <laughs> you want two-factor inception? Is that what you yeah. want? Odd factor. Tie that one to your phone, so if you lose it, you can't get it. Oh, uh, damn. Same, same problem. Yeah, exactly. All right, that's Authy. A-U-T-H-Y. All right, my pick comes from some uh, nice... Uh, who I forget who in the chat told me about it. Uh, oh, that looks uh, cool. 
I, f- I apologize. And it makes that noise. From Shout out. some young guy. The Star Wars Death Star popcorn maker, where the top of the Death Star is the bowl for the popcorn. I may actually buy one of these right it now. Looks like my daughter star. eats a lot of popcorn. Oh, I thought you were going to keep it here. Oh, hell no. Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, she comes here, so yeah, we could do that stuff. <laughs> yeah, we need popcorn, too. Look, see? Look, look the Stormtrooper took his glove off. Yeah, eating nice. some popcorn from there. 50 bucks, obviously a novelty price. Um, that's no moon. That's a popcorn maker from a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> right? And fluffy popcorn. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've used an air, <laughs> like an air popper for popcorn and not just use microwavable <laughs> popcorn bags before, so... Thank you very much. Well, I feel kind of bad that I'm not coughing as much as you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is <laughs> you, you should be here in the office. For some reason, I cough more when I'm quiet, when I'm silent and I'm not talking, versus when I was recording videos recently. And I really only looked like cough like twice during this hour plus long stream, right? So I think that's actually uh-huh. doing pretty good. Mm-hmm. Plus, I have this cool, cool, not warm anymore beverage. You know, alcoholic beverage. Yeah, that only dries out your throat. It's got apple cider in it. Yeah. Sure. And a cinnamon mm-hmm. stick. Yeah. And an orange. Yeah. Ginnaman. And I'm going to refill it after this. Uh, so that's it. That's it for the show this week, guys. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, PCPer.com slash podcast is the URL you can find. Uh, our show notes, download links. That's it. Just show notes, download links, RSS that's all, files. That's all that's on that website. Also, the whole website is at PCPro.com. <laughs> you should go there. I know. Uh, and thanks, everybody. And I hope everybody enjoyed my holiday sweater. See, the, they got Tauntauns down here. And They're not sliced open. Not yet. Nobody's writing them. They got snowflakes. Well, yeah. somebody can mug you and slice it open for you. I'll probably wear this I'm, in the I movie the on snow Friday, beast. too. Is that on there? That is the Tauntaun. There is no Wampa. No, 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 the Yeti thing. The Wampa. Oh. Um, I'm going to say no. Maybe by the time you've worn it for a week straight, then the sleeves will be <laughs> stretched out stretched enough. Out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Emily you calls that guns. the BB-8 logo. She calls it. That's, I don't know why, but that's what she does. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we'll have, uh, what's next week? The 20th? Yes. So we'll have a regular episode. I don't think we'll be missing any episodes for Christmas because... Christmas is on Monday, so Wednesday to Wednesday we should be good. So, all right, everybody, we'll see you next week. Thanks.